everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, CSPO's uh, first roundtable. This is the Center for Sustainable Palm Oil. This roundtable is on the subject of can conscious consumerism curb deforestation? My name is Dr. Nafiz Ahmed. I'll be your host for today uh, over this next hour or so. Um, and I have joining with me a really distinguished panel of guests from all over the world, from really two kind of main sectors in a way. We have people representing kind of consumer sentiment and, cons and, and, the, and the kind of the consumer world, experts in that kind of dimension. And we also have experts in issues around sustainability and specifically deforestation and palm oil. And we also have people who operate and work in the policy world are familiar with what's going on in the European Union, for instance, in, in the United Nations. We have a really, really exciting panel today. Um, and on one of the most important topics uh, you could ever imagine, deforestation. Deforestation is one of the biggest drivers of climate change. It's up there in the top 10 um, in terms of its contribution to carbon emissions. And it's often not recognized how devastating the, um, the consequences of deforestation can be. And I think um, as we're kind of seeing the impacts of the global pandemic, we're now beginning to kind of wake up to this ultimate realization that human society and the economy doesn't exist outside of the ecological system. I and mean, I think for the last century or so, we've kind of been living under this kind of kind of comfortable illusion that we can continue doing what we're doing and, and, and growing and consuming without any kind of thought about the boundaries in nature that we that we're inhabiting. And I think we're now starting to see that, yeah, while there are there are consequences, uh, often those consequences are are quite devastating and, and they can actually damage the scope for human habitation. Now I think the pandemic certainly has been one huge event a huge global event, which has demonstrated, you know, the risk of zoonotic diseases, you know, uh, diseases jumping from animal species. And, and we now know that, um, that there is obviously this issue of deforestation, increasing the risk of that taking place. So there's quite a lot for us to think about and digest. There's quite a lot at stake. Um, and I believe that we've just been joined by our first um, distinguished speaker who is going to be opening uh, the event and I'd like to introduce um, Ambassador Chad Blackman who is uh, the ambassador and permanent representative to the permanent mission of Barbados to the United Nations in Geneva. He is also chairman of the World Trade Organization Commission on Trade and Environment and he is a member of the global board of the International Gender Champions. This is a leadership network that brings together female and male decision makers determined to break down gender barriers and create gender equality in their spheres of influence. So it's absolutely wonderful that Ambassador Blackman, you can um, open today's event. And I would like to hand over to you uh, to, 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 to say a few words. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, for giving me the floor. Let me first apologize for having to join you from the back of my car. I'm actually rushing to another meeting, but I felt it important enough, uh, given the topic at hand, um, and particularly where we are in the world today, to, to join in with you, notwithstanding the circumstance. Uh, I'm also very honored to be in, invited to speak uh, in a round table on a vital and important discussion. A bit of context, uh, in 2015, the UN took a very important step by addressing sustainable development goals that calls for the end of poverty, also protecting the planet, and ensuring that by 2030, all people enjoy peace and prosperity. Now, amongst the SDGs are, of course, SDG 12 and SDG 13, which discuss climate action, sustainable production, and consumption. Now, in these goals, the UN seeks to achieve sustainable economic growth whilst reducing carbon footprint and improving awareness and education regarding climate change and promoting mechanisms that also curb climate change itself. These SDGs stress the important role of empowering women, youth, and local marginalized communities. Now, whilst palm oil has been 
uh, a much debated commodity. Not much attention has been paid to how palm oil, provided it is cultivated sustainably. In fact, benefits not only small holders, but is much more uh, sustainable in the long run compared to other crops. And this falls in line with the UN SDGs, which encourage sustainable natural resource management and human security in developing countries. Now, as ambassador of Barbados to the UN in Geneva, I certainly know the importance of trade in helping countries in the global South lift be lifted out of, pop <clears throat> of poverty. Now, within this conversation, I would really like to implore everyone that we must take into consideration the aspect of gender, as a large number of small farmers in agricultural sectors in the global South are, in fact, women. And we've seen that over the last year, this sector particularly being exposed in the advent of COVID-19 with reduced demand for agricultural goods. As a result, the International Gender Champions Network, of which I'm a board member, we are also seeking to empower leaders to come together to break down the gender barriers across different fields, and also empowering women working in the agricultural sectors as their role in this debate on sustainability is both imperative and critical. Thus, I, for one, welcome the efforts of the Center for of sustainable palm oil and other organizations who are seeking to focus on the gender aspect of the sustainability debate and encourage collaboration and dialogue. I once again want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to briefly speak to you, and I certainly look forward to the important and ongoing roundtable and certainly the outcome of today's dialogue. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for that thoughtful. Uh, introduction to these really important issues and highlighting that we need to think about trade you know we need to think about poverty um you know we need to think about gender um we need to think about small farmers lots of different areas which all intersect and all of that we need to be bearing in mind when we're thinking about climate change and deforestation so it's really important i think from the ambassador's uh, introduction and hopefully we will be able to uh, bring this across in today's discussion that we cannot silo off any of these issues. We need to think about them holistically and we, need, we have to have solutions that deal with all of these issues. You know, we can't only talk about the environment and forget about the SDGs and sustainable development goals. We have to be able to, to do all of this holistically. So it's a big challenge. And you know, I'm, I'm kind of conscious of the fact that in my own work as an environment journalist over the last 20 years, you know, I've been in a way on the cold face, seeing um, story after story of devastation. And one of the most uh, frightening ones actually that I reported um, just last year was uh, that there was a new study modeling uh, the potential impact of deforestation um, if it continues at the current rates. And it showed that within the next two to four decades, there was a 90% probability of civilization collapsing as a result of the wider cascading effects of the loss of forests. So that just illustrates you know, that, that this is a really serious issue and we need to get this right. And with that in mind, um, I would like to briefly just, um, I'm gonna briefly introduce all our panelists. Um, and then obviously as I, as, we, as I invite each of you to, 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 to say a few words about some specific issues, I'll introduce you in a bit more detail, but just to give you, uh, listeners a sense of who we have. We have uh, Amina Khan, uh, uh, well-known British mod model and fashion designer, an award-winning influencer and entrepreneur. I'm sure many of you follow her. We have Robert He, who's a renowned sustainability expert, who's written widely on nature conservation and biodiversity, and specifically also on, on palm oil. We have uh, Camilla Burungi, uh, who's a New York-based uh, fashion model, social innovator, uh, and business strategist for enterprises operating in line with the SDGs. And we have uh, Mariam Harut Union, who is a sustainable innovation consultant and founder of Belgian sustainable streetwear brand, Kin Armat. Um, so without further ado, I think we should go straight in. Um, and I have um, my opening question uh, to, to Robert, actually. And I think this is a good start because you can, in a way, frame the discussion for us from a policy point of view. And given your background in um, sustainability, um, kind of how this interacts with what's going on, demands from, from, from the consumer society, 
we know that deforestation is largely driven by kind of increased Western consumer demand for all sorts of these goods. And that to some extent, this is being done at the expense of the world's rainforests in these tropical regions. So how can our, and it's a big question to open with, just feel free to answer it in, a specific, in, in, in how you want, you don't need to cover everything, but to give us a good sense. How do you think our daily consumer choices can kind of mitigate these environmental impacts? Do you believe there's a gap between consumer awareness and what are the leading drivers of deforestation and how we can fix this? Uh, very definitely. Uh, one thing, though, I mean, we're, talk we're talking about palm oil, but the consumers should be aware that uh, the other drivers of uh, deforestation include very popular products like uh, cocoa, uh, soy. So when we talk about sustainability of one particular commodity like palm oil, we should really be trying to apply uh, those same questions to everything that's, uh, that's involved in the consumer product. So for a chocolate bar, for example, there's a lot of focus on the use of palm oil, which more often than not is just a side ingredient, whereas cocoa, which is responsible for so much deforestation in Africa, uh, escapes questions. Nobody looks at cocoa. So... <clears throat> For the consumers, they have to be, they have to be aware. There's a huge information gap between what's happening with the other commodities and what's happening with palm oil. Palm oil, everybody knows about, it. but the information gap for the consumers should be that uh, everything that they consume has an impact on uh, forests worldwide. So there should be increased awareness on uh, in that aspect. We should broaden the conversation to include everything within the consumer product and not just look at palm oil. Thank you, Robert. That's that's really interesting and really, really good points. And I'm reminded of the fact that the number one driver of deforestation is actually um, is actually beef production. Um, yes. <laughs> and of course, soy and, soy and beef combined, and soy obviously used as animal feed um, for livestock industry. I mean, these two are, are completely outweigh um, uh, the role of palm oil um, and, and, and even the role of other commodities as well. And yet we don't really see very much attention uh, within Europe to the issue of, oh, well, let's kind of boycott beef, for instance, which kind of raises all sorts of questions. But I mean, well, I think your broader uh, the broader point about you know, the fact that really we need to broaden the conversation. You know, it's not focusing on what, and no one is saying we shouldn't look at palm oil. We have to look at palm oil, but also look at cocoa, look at soya, look at beef, look at these other things. So it kind of leads me, I've got a question for you, Amina, um, um, really about the space that you're working in. Um, and obviously there are certain forest procured commodities that form an overwhelming part of the beauty industry. And you, this is a space which you work in, you're very familiar with. Um, and it's, it's said that palm oil can be found in, in around 70% of all beauty products. And as someone who's quite prominent in the lifestyle and, and beauty industries, how do you ensure, um, I guess as a consumer even, um, that the products you're using and promoting are sustainably produced? And you know, what do you think can be done You know by leading beauty brands to, to kind of, to contribute productively to this, to this issue? Well, Nafiz, what I find actually shocking initially was that palm oil sustainability was never at the forefront of my mind simply because it was never sort of presented as something to be concerned about. So in the beauty industry, especially in recent years, there's been a lot more emphasis on, for example, vegan beauty products. And so I think that's indicative of just how much big beauty brands are leading the consumer in that the information that they feed us or discuss or even print on the packaging is really leading the way in um, determining what consumers and influencers are choosing in terms of the products that they want to buy and the brands that they want to support. So for me, I've been learning about this myself, okay? I did a YouTube video exploring this, felt like a bit of a journalist myself. 
Um, but I learned so much from you and the other speakers there about just how important it is for us to have a look at sustainable palm oil options and also to research ourselves because you know just the other day I didn't realize 70% of beauty products contain palm oil you know and it wasn't until I personally emailed beauty brands asking them that I learned more about the fact that they were actually now becoming concerned about uh, whether their palm oil is sustainable. And so I think that it is, we have the power as not only consumers, but also as influencers to contact these brands and, and almost sort of gently put a bit of pressure on them to consider how their products are being made, um, how the ingredients are being sourced. And I think that's the only way that brands will learn to make a change and also to be involved in educating because there's only so much that we can educate ourselves like you know I was proactive that's just that's how I am I like to go and research but not everybody's like that and so I think that brands do definitely have a big responsibility in um, supporting this movement. Thank you Amina that's um, that's really interesting and also really fascinating to hear your your personal journey um, which I think is, which, which is quite telling and says a lot, I guess, about um, the challenge that we have, that you know, there's still so much kind of to do in terms of educating people and reaching consumers, um, especially when someone like yourself in the heart of the industry is finding that you're, you, know, you have so much more to learn about, about the issues. So that's really interesting to hear. It's not straightforward. Um, Can I also say, for example, if I, if I were a cruelty-free product, I'll pick up you know, an eyeshadow palette and on the back, there'll be a little leaping bunny and that will tell me that it's, and it's immediate. That information is quick. You know, I've got it. I can get on with my day. There's no such logo or representation that tells me this is you know, MSPO certified or this is, you know, that this is derived from sustainable palm oil um, or use the sustainable palm oil rather. So, you know, it's not, the industry is not making it easy for people like me who are trying to learn and do better and be more environmentally friendly and, you know, be more sustainable. It doesn't really assist us in making those decisions as much as it can. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, I think I'd like to bring in uh, Camilla uh, on this because um, obviously I think the issues that have come up here are this, you know we've got this connection between consumer demand and deforestation um, and I think we're seeing that there's on the, on the one hand there's what Robert described which is you know we, and, and you know what the ambassador Blackman also kind of hinted at that we need to balance this need for economic growth and development with the need to protect our environment but we also, I think, what, what from, from Amina's um, intervention, we're hearing that at the same time, many of the brands that are driving growth in, in the Western world are actually kind of really, in a way, playing this determining role in what consumers believe about the issues, um, which, you know, in, sometimes can be good, but also can, can be really bad and it can leave people in the dark. Um, so, do you think that consumers, have the power to influence the direction of governments or businesses towards kind of greener, more sustainable development? Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to be here uh, to answer that question. I, I'm a hopeless romantic, first of all, so I always believe that the people have the power and um, I actually believe they do. And we see this in other uh, in instances and scenarios. Um, we are seeing so much change happening on the consumer front. The consumer is getting more educated about these issues. And they're also recognizing that, the, that they have the power, they have buying power. Um, uh, we, when it comes to the brands, uh, a lot of brands are trying to make this switch. A lot of big brands have signed on to the SDGs. Uh, but, the, but the issue becomes like, uh, how do they compromise making profit and, uh, you know, uh, sticking to these mandates and delivering on these mandates? How do they continue to meet their KPIs as well as meet these policy demands? I feel like the will is there. There is this disconnect. Um, the consumer also has the will, but we see definitely that the consumer can shift things. And here in the US, um, we are seeing a lot of that happening um, when it comes to, we just had uh, during COVID-19, the Black Lives Matter movement 
like really catapult. And what happened was a complete shift in uh, consumer, uh, uh, in, in consumption, you know, when it comes to some of these brands, a lot of brands that were not supporting, uh, you know, people of color, or maybe they didn't have products that were servicing all ethnicities are starting to go into these spaces. And uh, uh, definitely, I believe that if we get the consumers going, then the brands will also make the change. They have the will, but they need to know that they're gonna be able to make a profit as well. Thank you, that's really interesting, uh, Camilla. I mean, I, the one thing that I thought of when you were talking about this issue was, um, in relation to obviously the BLM movement kind of really kind of highlight, I think created a kind of a lot of soul searching amongst, um, you know, thankfully amongst many big companies and so on and so forth. Um, I'm mean, obviously some of this was just, you know, cosmetic in a sense, just for, for show, but there's some real changes that have happened. But of course, on this particular issue, there's a whole swathe of people who are kind of not really considered. And I think, um, we've heard about small farmers, we've heard about um, women who are predominantly female um, small farmers who are often forgotten and left out of this debate in terms of, you know, what we do. Um, how do we kind of get brands to think about, um, to, to kind of really think about this stuff, not just in terms of showing, oh, oh wow, you know, we care about sustainability, but actually genuinely dealing with some of these issues on the ground? Um, I think that there's also been a shift once again during COVID and how we've all gone virtual. What I'm finding in my world is a lot of these conversations I was having with people at the last mile or people that work with uh, folks at the last mile and uh, trying to link them to the, you know, the North-South connection. Um, what I'm finding is now that we are all virtual, we can have these conversations. We can have these inclusive conversations. like. If we wanted to invite some farmers to this virtual Zoom, uh, we could do that actually today. So really like having these really conversations that are inclusive of all stakeholders and not just really like top down, but also trying to look at the bottom up approach. Um, really in my work, uh, really we, we ask the people that what's going on, what do you need? Um, I'll give you like an example. Um, I'm currently working with a community uh, of Batoro people in Southwest Uganda. We are working on a cultural, uh, a cultural refor reforestation project. Uh, we looked at this as we wanted to, we knew that we wanted to go and plant trees, but we were like, how can we plant trees that we know that these people will be motivated? What trees do they want to plant? And they just so happened to have a tree that was central to their culture. And they were like, we would really love to plant more of these trees. And we were saying, don't cut down trees, but what options are we giving them from cutting down trees? Um, you, have to, you have to relate and get the context of who you're dealing with and not come in with, oh, this is what we're doing and this is our policy and you know, find out how they can be included in these narratives. I feel like that's really key and important. Thank you. That's um, that's really interesting. That's, that's a really important issue. You know, I think engaging with these communities inclusively, rather than just kind of barging in and saying, "Oh, this is how things need to be done." Um, so, Mariam, um, I'd love to get your thoughts on this because um, I know that you wrote a recent commentary. I think this was last year about the global fashion industry um, and you know the issues around climate change. And I think in your piece, you wrote that. Um, Climate change, although climate change is kind of seen as something linked to you know, the meat industry or aviation and oil, um, it's heavily driven by the global fashion industry, which is which is responsible for something like ten percent of the world's carbon emissions, which is absolutely astonishing figure. Um, so, given this background, um, can you explain uh, what, in your view, I mean, I guess following Camilla's comments as well. Um, the relevance of ethical consumerism, um, especially in light of claims that the fashion in industry kind of, you know, we have, we're hearing about fast fashion and that there are these quick fixes, um, lack of long-term thinking. What, you know, what do you think that, how can ethical consumerism kind of 
begin, can ethical consumerism transform uh, the fashion industry? And, and, and if so, how? Yeah, thank you very much, <clears throat> Nafiz. Um, I love to be here in this panel as well, sharing my thoughts and learning more about the subject as well at the same time. Um, indeed, I am um, active in the fashion industry and I wrote this piece um, about ethical consumerism. It, it has been there for a while, but has gained traction in the last few decades. And I think indeed because of, um, well, amongst others, global warming and the flooding. For example, last week here in Belgium, uh, people lost their houses because of the flooding. And I don't think they have ever seen that coming in a country like Belgium, never seen that in the, in the last decades, something happening like that. And uh, ethical consumerism is um, a system to address these issues. Um, people realize that we have a responsibility, but at the same time, seeing the bigger picture, um, for example, um, especially um, let's say um, the millennials and Generation Z because they are more aware of what is going on and they actually put this on the agenda. Um, when we're talking about, um, I think Camilla also uh, mentioned this about, the, about their buying power. If we know that in 2018, it was estimated to be something else 140 billion. And for millennials in 2013, it will be 4 trillion. Knowing that that's their buying power, uh, having brands that actually focus, uh, well, having more and more that profit and principles are connected. I don't think they can afford not to act on this. Um, a couple of weeks ago, actually last week or two weeks ago, um, a huge uh, beauty brand launched uh, or announced a launch to introduce rebranding, becoming fully sustainable. And I think I just learned from Amina as well that it's 70% of beauty products that contain palm oil. So I think it's a very interesting moment to have this conversation as well, because a lot of um, brands being in the fashion industry or in the beauty industry are realizing that if they do not adapt right now, they will not be able to compete with the other brands in the future. Um, and I think it's interesting to learn as well in which other industries we can apply palm oil. Uh, we know that in the beauty industry, it's a very interesting um, or very crucial product. Um, how we can apply that as well in uh, in other industries. I think that's very interesting because I would love to, and I am one, uh, an advocate on the palm oil as well. And I would, uh, as an innovation uh, consultant on sustainability, I think it's interesting to learn more about that, to be, know, uh, be able to know how we can advise more brands um, to take that uh, into account. Um, I think that's, you know, when we educate the people, because I, I would love to collaborate more on that later, but um, for consumers, if we, there's a lot of misinformation going on and if we're able to educate them, they will set pressure on these larger brands. And I think there is a movement uh, I see in larger brands that I am observing, um, some giants in the fashion industry as well. And they are making changes. When you go to their product page, now you can trace from beginning to end, from garment to um, once it arrives at your house, what they're doing to be sustainable, to care more about the environment, and at the same, same time, also um, the environment of um, the garment workers. And I think there is a the last thing that I want to add to this about Kinarmat. When I launched it in 2018, it's a brand that empowers women um, when I launched it, I also got the question and, but I was also, you know, that was my mindset as well, being if you're launching a brand that empowers women and uh, to claim their spot in society, I don't think you can produce in an environment where, because mostly women work in, um, you know, garments, uh, in the garment industry, in the fashion industry, exploiting them. So uh, I made sure at the other end of my story matched up as well, not only environment, but also the garment workers. And I got that question because my audience is millennials and Generation Z. So they do ask you the questions, especially now in social media era, and they push you to think about it, even being a small uh, player in the fashion industry, um, they do ask you the questions. So I think they're, them pressuring the bigger brands uh, will have a great effect. Thank you, Mariam. That's a, a lot of food for thought there on how we can um, try to put pressure on brands. Um, I, I like this idea of kind of the, the importance of recognizing buying power amongst consumers. Uh, I think this is a big thing that there's definitely this um, 
realization, consumers wield a lot of power. Um, but this brings me back, I'd like to come back to Robert um, to get a bit more of the sustainability and policy context now that we've heard. Um, we've heard some really fascinating perspectives from, from you know, looking at what's going on in the consumer sector. Um, but how then do we square this with what's going on with the challenges in the palm oil industry, for instance? I mean, we've heard that um, obviously palm oil is not necessarily the only, it's not the only commodity that's problematic, um, but certainly in the beauty industry, for instance, you know, it's, it plays quite a big role. Um, but we also know that palm oil is um, the main agricultural export for uh, two countries, Malaysia and Indonesia. They're the largest palm oil producers in the world. And that secures livelihoods for millions of smallholder farmers. Um, and of course, there are not to mention 11 million people in those two countries that are indirectly dependent on the, you know, the palm oil sector. So from their point of view, these discussions could almost seem, um, I mean, like in a way threatening in the sense that, well, we're talking about this stuff, environmental, blah, 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 these long run changes, but what about the reality of people's livelihoods on the ground um, and all the rest of it? So I guess my question is, um, how do we, you know, we've got this increased risk of deforestation. How do we reconcile these competing pressures? You know, is there a way of meeting consumer demands without doing so at the expense of our forests um, and without also undermining the livelihoods of smallholder farmers? I think this is the big kind of, you know, how do we balance all of these different things? Is it possible? Is it feasible? It's definitely feasible in terms of the uh, palm oil industry itself is one of the most uh, heavily certified and <clears throat> regulated commodities. And I would say that certification is the best way forward to try and find a balance between development and uh, conservation. Um, <clears throat> from what I've seen on the ground since the uh, 2008, when the whole concept of sustainability started to creep into the uh, industries in Indonesia and Malaysia, it definitely has a big impact. I know there's some NGOs that argue against it, but as I said, uh, <clears throat> from what I've seen uh, from the activities at the RSPO, uh, followed later on by the national schemes, the MSPO and the ISPO, Certification is definitely the way to try and find a balance because the schemes themselves uh, becomes a moderating field or uh, a middle ground where say, for example, a local community has a problem with a plantation. They can now take it to the uh, certification scheme and have that ironed out. Um, if there's any accusations of uh, deforestation or human rights abuses, Again, the certification scheme can step in and uh, try to mediate or resolve those issues. Um, <clears throat> looking forward, especially yeah. with the EU's uh, talk about due diligence for corporations uh, and the criticism that uh, voluntary schemes do not work, what I would suggest is that uh, the MSPO should be you know, cl closely observe for what it has done. And <clears throat> as one of the most dynamic uh, mandatory schemes right now for palm oil, that would be a model that uh, I think a lot of the other commodities should follow as well in, uh, you know, certifying that there's no rampant deforestation happening, there's no human rights abuses, there's no land grabs or anything like that. Thanks, Robert. That's really interesting. I mean, it's interesting for me as well, because I, I did a report um, last year um, oh. in the context of the pandemic, uh, talking, looking into some of the um, these issues around deforestation. And um, I was very, very uh, interested to, to see that um, there was this kind of strange disparity um, in the discussions around 
sustainability certification and not much attention given to uh, MSPO, for instance, which in case viewers aren't aware, is the, stands for Malaysia Sustainable Palm Oil, which, as you said, is the national kind of mandatory certification scheme. Uh -huh. uh, and what was very intriguing for me was seeing how MSPO, uh, since MSPO was implemented, um, there's been this quite a dramatic reduction in um, the rate of deforestation. You know, if you're talking about from you know millions of hectares down to like you know 250,000 hectares to, and, and, <coughs> and dropping, dropping every year uh -huh. um, and month by month. Um, which interestingly, some NGOs have um, been quite vocal about noticing that this has actually happened which has been a bit of a shift you know some NGOs have, have, have acknowledged this but on the other hand um you know there are still these persistent concerns you know we've had stories for example um last year come out about some horrendous stories of, of abuse of women um in palm oil plantations and things like that um so it'd be good to hear your sense of how um these certification schemes are you know, are these certification schemes just, are they a cover for, you know, the continuation of, of, of continued, you know, deforestation or human rights abuses? Or is there something, is that unfair? You know, are these stories that we're hearing um, focusing on and amplifying, you know, things that have happened, but do not represent the whole industry? It'd be really good to get your position on this as someone who's seen what's going on. Yeah, those uh, media reports were definitely uh, very unfair. One of them mentioned that they <clears throat> interviewed something like 100 workers in Malaysia, and they featured about five or six of them. Now, if you think in terms of the total number of workers in the uh, industry itself, uh, just out of Malaysia, I think there's some uh, something like uh, 200,000 people that work in the uh, plantations. So if you're talking to 100 of, 100 of them and you find, say, six of them that have problems, that is not an indication that the abuse is rife, is rampant in the industry. I mean, there's always going to be ropes. There's going to uh, always going to be uh, those criminal elements in our societies and the plantations are no different. So for the media report to come out and you know slam the whole industry with those big headlines, uh, labor, labor abuse, sexual abuse of plantations, that was completely unfair. But <clears throat> you know how do you how do you challenge uh, things like that? Uh, you go back to certification, certification that involves say uh, environmental groups, civil societies. And you come up with uh, with uh, with solutions. I mean, the criminal elements will always be there. You can have the highest standards in the world, but you're always going to get that uh, that one incident of somebody abusing a worker, or you know something like that. It shouldn't it shouldn't be a gauge of the industry itself. If you've seen the number of uh, uh, workers that I have seen, I, I met uh, quite a few hundred of them, and they all have really inspiring stories. You know, these workers coming from uh, Bangladesh, India, Nepal, uh, even Indonesia, that are making a good living in uh, Malaysia, they're comfortable, they're saving enough money that they can actually support their families back home. So these are the kind of stories that uh, should be brought out to, uh, I guess, neutralize some of the negative stories on palm oil. Thank you, Robert. I mean, certainly I'd, I'd say myself as a journalist, um, I've, you know, obviously, you know, negative stories, there's no reason not to cover them, but absolutely, as you said, we have to put these in context. And I think Western journalists often find themselves, you know, unfamiliar with the environments they're reporting on, have no idea how the industry works. And I've been, you know, personally, I've, I've um, found it disconcerting that there's been such a lack of interest amongst uh, environmental journalists who say they're interested in deforestation and environmental issues, but don't really investigate um, some of these certification standards and how they're really working 
um, you know, have shown very little interest in MSPO. Um, I, I personally was very interested and excited by it. Um, and I think that's, it's a shame, you know, and, and certainly we, we need a lot more of a bigger picture. Um, and it doesn't mean we ignore abuses, but it certainly means that we have a proper balanced view which looks at everything that's going on in the industry. Mm -hmm. um, and on, on, on that note, um, I'm, I'm conscious I'm, that of time, we're slightly behind schedule. So before we continue, uh, I have a, a question um, from um, a distinguished guest, uh, Claus Jensen, who serves as the special advisor to the Danish Ministry of Food, Agriculture and Fisheries. Now, uh, Klaus, has, he has a decade of experience in natural resource governance. He's been in, an embedded consultant to, to the governments of both Sierra Leone and Malawi, implementing sustainable licensing procedures for commercial forestry um, to reduce discretionary powers and prevent further deforestation. So here we have someone who has a really distinguished record in actually you know, dealing with these issues from a European point of view. So I'd really love to welcome Klaus and, and, and have you um, say some comments and ask any questions you see fit. Hi there, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, I seem to have a bit of connectivity issues, but I hope that you can all hear and see me. Um, first of all, uh, a very big thank you to the, to the CSPO for hosting this important roundtable. The discussions are very important as uh, palm, palm, palm oil when sourced sustainably is an immense and resourceful crop. And I'm therefore happy that we're having this conversation and the furthering of this debate today. Um, it's important to promote a holistic approach to sustainability, which includes production at all levels and ethical consumption as well. Uh, as part of this debate, we must take into consideration the sharing of expertise, expertise between develop, uh, developed and developing nations. And I would therefore like to, to, to post um, uh, two questions to, to the, the panelists. Uh, one is how can the EU and the Global South create a more, a more cooperative partnerships uh, in improving global sustainability standards? Uh, and since today's topic is on consumerism, uh, in the panelists' uh, view, I, I would I would like to to hear how how they see active consumerism compare or perhaps relate to political regulation of the producing sector. Um, and maybe a final question to Robert, um, what constitutes uh, in, in, your, uh, uh, in your world, the most ideal certifying organ? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Klaus. Uh, Robert, please go ahead and answer that question. Uh, the question was what constitutes the best uh, uh, what certification system? I think so, yes. What's the best certification standard to your mind ideal that, uh, that ex exists at the moment? Um, I, I would say the, the MSPO as a uh, national mandatory system would work the best. Because it balances out the uh, it balances out completely the needs of uh, the development of uh, countries, and it keeps a, a mindful eye on the demands of its consumers for for conservation. Whereas with uh, <clears throat> with voluntary certification schemes, for example, the the impacts are limited to what the plantations, the companies decide to uh, certify uh, or not certify. And when you compare that to something like a national scheme where every drop of palm oil, uh, every inch of planted farm has to be certified, that has to be seen as a superior scheme um, in light of what uh, <clears throat> what's been said about the SDGs, I think it's, uh, uh, one of the best certification schemes to meet the SDGs, not just for growing countries, but also for uh, uh, consuming countries. So for Klaus, if you haven't had a chance to take a look at the uh, mandatory schemes like the MSPO, 
it's it's very interesting. There's a lot of very positive things happening on the ground. Uh, we're talking about protection of biodiversity, upholding uh, indigenous rights, uh, workers' rights, and all that stuff. What you read in the media, you know, read with a with a grain of salt because a lot of it is false. Did Thanks that answer your question? No, that's yeah, that's really interesting. Um, thank you. Um, and I guess I'd like to follow on from uh, Klaus's raised this issue of how, you know what's the focus of action in terms of you know active consumerism or political regulation of the producing sector. You know where does the emphasis lie? And I think on this, I think um, Camilla, if I could come back to you, um, given your experience of engagement with the agricultural sector in the global south. How important are these commodities to the livelihoods of smallholder farmers um, in the South? And what does that mean for how issues like inclusion need to be part of the sustainability debate? And in that sense, you know, dealing with Clause's issue about the balance between consumerism and regulation, where, where do you think the future lies? Um, thank you for that question. Um... So when it comes to uh, you know the people on the last mile, um, I, I can give you an example. Um, palm oil is very central to African diet, uh, predominantly West African diet. Like uh, if you ever told them that there was even a policy considering uh, that will alter the economy of palm oil, you know they would be. They, they are not even aware that there's anything like this, right? They're going about their lives. Um, so, so really, like, how do we bridge that gap? How do we balance, right? How do we have these conversations, right? Um, I mean, in terms of the small smallholder farmer, I mean, they this is central to their livelihood, right? Like they're then producing this product, so they are not aware that these policies are going to affect their livelihood. You know, uh, they're actually looking at growing these um, these industries. You know, expanding, exporting. They're they're planning to grow the, their their industry and they're not aware that these policies are happening right so it's it's very important that you know the the eu and other governments um you know engage with you know these african governments as well right and bring them into the conversation and as well as like encourage them to like uh develop these uh, uh sustainability sustainability schemes and certifications. And that's why the MSPO is really interesting because Malaysia being a country that's, you know, developing and growing, it's very difficult for African governments to develop sustainability certification schemes that match the EU or the Western countries. It just doesn't really apply to the context. When they have a country like Uganda, for example, that's an agricultural country that is made of probably 90% smallholder farmers that are mostly women, you know, these are the things that we really need to bring to the forefront. Like, this is not what it looks like for everybody. Uh, I hope I've answered your question. <laughs> no, that's really interesting, Camilla. And I think what one of the themes that is emerging is this kind of this challenge of the mismatch between, um, you know, kind of you, the European Union and the policy developments that are going on there. Um, Often you're also driven by domestic consumer perceptions and sentiment, and also the reality of what's going on in developing countries and their needs, and finding a way to bridge that divide uh, in a way, and, 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 to, and to stop that being a divide, and to find a way of, of these issues becoming uh, kind of cooperative and working together. Um, just as a master of house, little, sorry, Camilla, continue. Yeah. I'll give you a little anecdote. I think. You know, I've been living in uh, New York for over 15 years plus, and I, you know, we have quite the African diaspora in New York. We come from all over countries, and we were so excited when Whole Foods got palm oil in their aisle. We were like, wow, we now can cook. Like, you know, usually you have to travel to ethnic markets and everything. And sure enough, in a couple of uh, months, it was gone. And you ask you, where is it? We are so excited. This is like, and they're like, no, it's boycotted. And so these boycotts, we have to be very, very uh, uh, educated about these boycotts. And there's a huge cancel culture happening, you know, in all industries, in fashion. And we have to be very 
careful and cautious about these boycotts and this council culture, we have to get the full story before we make certain decisions that could impact the lives of so many vulnerable people. Thanks, Camilla. That's a really important point, which I'll come back to in a second. I just have a bit of housekeeping, which is for audience members, um, if you have any questions, you can do, please do um, um, roll them in. Um, I believe you can do that using the um, Q&A function. Make sure that you can keep them coming. Um, and we have our team, there's a, a, a team at CSPO is keeping track of those and we'll be able to hopefully um, field those questions to our panel. Um, but just coming back to your point, Camilla, that's really interesting because one of the questions that has emerged a lot is the impact of boycotting palm oil. And there's been several studies um, which I've you know, reported on over the years, and I think many other people have slowly become aware that if you boycott palm oil, there are these other impacts and the demand and the need for um, you know, this kind of commodity means that you will switch to more dangerous um, food commodities, which even though right now, maybe their, their, their footprint isn't as large, but once you kind of displace palm oil, which is quite an efficient crop with, say with soya or with rapeseed or with other commodities, there's this risk that you'll have a much bigger land footprint, um, which could obviously drive even greater degrees of deforestation. And that's the kind of systems thinking, I think, which is often missing from these debates. Like, I mean, it's understandable, yes, you know, we don't want to buy a product which we think is which potentially devastating, but the solutions are not that easy. We have to think about the economic impacts, the environmental impacts, the social consequences, all these things we need to think about. Um, so that, I think, um, uh, Amin, I'd like to come back to you um, on this issue of, of um, really, ethical consumerism and the fact that there, there's so much of this complexity around these issues. Um, and as someone who's kind of, you know, worked in, in these sectors, what's your impression of actual consumer attitudes towards beauty and fashion brands about using sustainable ingredients? And you, men you mentioned that um, to some extent, the beauty brands are leading that conversation. So that kind of leads me to ask, um, you know, are these really major priorities for consumers? And whether they are or they aren't, do you think that they're convinced by what major brands are doing to become environmentally responsible? I think, yes, they're definitely becoming convinced. I think that in recent years, issues like climate change and especially um, human rights have really made their way to the forefront of the, social, the conversations on social media, which are now moving into more that consumer space. So you'll see it on you know, a brand page that's about makeup, there will be conversations, people asking the questions. I think we're kind of at this crux of, once consumers really understand the human rights issues at stake here and how the majority of this workforce is, is women and the risk of sexual abuse happening, I think that, brands are really going to have their day of reckoning of, of, of really getting clued up very, very quickly, because at the moment I see this sort of rumble. It hasn't really come fully to the forefront. Um, but I think that consumers are so suggestive in that. I mean, me, like the other day I was I was getting something from my snack cupboard and um, it said on there doesn't contain palm oil. And immediately I thought, oh, great, yay, doesn't contain palm oil. And then I thought, oh, should it not? Wait, okay, so this is something I need to be concerned about. I mean, we are really that suggestive. Um, and so if beauty brands were to focus on how and where they're sourcing their palm oil from, I think that that would spur on the consumer. But the problem is, is that it is a pretty complex um, issue here because when I wrote to for example Charlotte Tilbury they replied and said yes we're really trying to get the certification in place yes our our makeup products do contain um, ingredients derived from palm oil but in order for us to really trace you know every step of the production process it's very complicated it's very difficult oh but we're trying um, so that didn't really answer my question. And so it's a question I have actually for the panelists and the experts here, because I'm trying to learn, you know, how can we simplify this process so that brands are more willing to focus on this? 
Um, because I do think whether it's kicking and screaming, they will be faced with this issue of where is your palm oil coming from? And you can't just tell us it doesn't contain palm oil because the alternatives are less efficient and more devastating. And you didn't tell us that. Consumers don't like being lied to. We're, we're, they're becoming so much more smart um, and educated and are doing the research. So how can we make this easier for everyone, both brands and the consumers? Sorry, I'm asking you a question here. <laughs> No, that's great. That's a really important question. Actually, I'd like to, in a way, direct that question to, to Mariam, um, just to get your sense of that. I mean, because obviously this is, I mean, there's a term for this. It's called greenwashing, which is this idea that, um, you know, brands and are just say are just claiming to be environmentally responsible when actually they're not. I and mean, I think there's a statistic I have here. As many as 40% of environmental claims found online could be misleading consumers into making purchases of products that don't actually meet their standards or reflect their values, which is an astonishing amount. So given that context, and I think um, Amna has really raised this interesting point, this question for all of us, really, what kind of information or support do consumers need to be able to make kind of informed choices and avoid kind of traps of buying into false environmental claims? I mean, it, it makes me wonder to what extent is these claim are these claims about palm oil irresponsible in a way um and kind of because they're decomplexifying a, a, an issue and not really pointing at a solution i mean that's the kind of side issue i mean more interested in marion what you think about you know what what is there that we can do to for, to kind of inform consumers and you know what's your sense yeah i'd love to just have your thoughts on what Amina was saying sure um, I think there are um, different things about that um, being um, certification and awareness. I think we briefly touched the point of the certification part. And then we have awareness, which I also talked about, you know, when you, um, you're you not aware of, of whatever is in that product and whatever you're buying and where it comes from, et cetera. Um, it comes from the misinformation that we get, um, the things that the media stream that reaches us, being that, you know, knowing that palm oil has made more progress in uh, declining deforestation than any other um, alternative, but we're now very aware of that. Um, it's that misinformation that leads us to buy other stuff or stuff that we are not really don't know the information about. And when it comes to the fashion industry, I know that um, we do, you know, I know all the certificates of that. I know um, which ones to trust and where to go. And because all my, um, well, the clothes that I put on the market are also certified. So um, there is, be, that been, that has been going on for a longer period of time. So people are more aware of that and asking more questions about that. Um, and I think um, what also happened when on the consumer side is that, you know, the awareness aspect, what the COVID-19 pandemic did was a pattern shift. So people um, who were not really uh, busy with, um, should I buy sustainable products or did not pay attention to that, now actually have that mindset uh, shift or switch while they're now paying attention to that. And I think how we can know that, I think that's from the, from the um, fashion industry and also in, in any other industry, when you're just buying a product now on my website as well, you have all the certificates there and you can actually know where my garments come from, where they're being produced and which products I use, et cetera, to know that you can trust it. And I think we should do the same with when it comes to um, products that contain palm oil. Um, you have their certification, but also the awareness around that making sure that people um, have the right information. How we're going to do that, I will leave that to the experts when it comes to palm oil about, you know, how do we make sure that we can distinguish the, um, well, the, the greenwashing as in the fraudulent green and the real green products from one, one another. Um, do we make sure that people know which certificates are out there, um, which ones they can trust and putting that to the forefront? Um, as the same way we did with the fashion industry. I think that's the line we should um, follow um, as we're really um, putting that on the agenda. So making sure that the consumers, the large part of the consumers um, being in my case, representing my millennials and Generation Z, that they know which, because for, for example, the Fairware Foundation is very well known for my industry and my customers know which one they should look for and I think we should just have that for um, the beauty industry as well. Can I add something to that? 
Absolutely, um, please. <laughs> just because this is something that I've had to kind of realize in my work as well, when it comes to awareness is, you know, one of the things that strategies that we use is in awareness is what, what narrative are we telling and how are we telling it? So it's very important to also include storytelling. We know that content is king and people are online all day, all night. And we, can, we know the power of how one video can go viral. So collaborating with creatives, like how do all stakeholders come to the table? How do creatives come to the table? So in my work with you know, reforestation, like what we're doing with the Batoro, we are actually engaging the creative community to come and support our work so that it translates within the community. Because you know, one of the ways that um, Africans uh, from age old times, we, we managed to protect our environment was through our storytelling, through our music, you know, through our art, through our dance, you know, through our you know, names, we give each other names, we give each other clans, we actually are organized in totems and clans and everybody's clan is linked to an animal. And you know that this is my job for my life, like this animal is central to my livelihood. So, you know, these are the kind of strategies that cannot just be very like top level, but how do you bring it down? How do you bring it down to the consumer, whether it's a Western consumer? And the beauty of content is I could be in Toro or I could be in New York and I could watch the same video and how does it make me feel and act and react? That's what I'm done. <laughs> now, let me add something because I, I, that's exactly what uh, you know the the majority is waiting for is that content that they can learn from because we have to make it very easy for everybody to learn more about it and to be able to get that information in a very easy way because from the moment that people have to do that extra effort and not everybody at this moment is aware that they should do their own research. So we have to find a way to make it very easy that it reaches them in a very easy way without taking away their luxurious lives and making it extra difficult for them to find that information. Once we don't touch these two areas, I think everybody will be interested in learning more about it. So it's like, how do we make it easier for them? And indeed, having a, a content that goes viral is one of the easy ways. Um, but it's to find that way to educate them and uh, make sure that they're aware that they should go find that information. Thank you both, Camilla, Mariam. A really um, fascinating discussion that just kicked off there. Um, and yeah, again, we are a little bit behind schedule. So I'd like to take this opportunity to bring in uh, another intervention from a distinguished expert. Um, we have here with us uh, Paulo Casaca, who is a, he's a Portuguese politician, a former member of the European Parliament, and he is the founder and executive director of the South Asia Democratic Forum, also the founder of the Euro Reform Initiative um, and of a consultancy, comp a consultancy company on sustainable development registered in Brussels, less means more. Um, uh, so, dear uh, Paulo, please, if you could um, um, respond to this, uh, to what you've heard, and any question that you might have. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I think that we are all over the world, and uh, let me congratulate all of you for your very significant contributions. I think that, uh, uh, Robert, you really explained how we can speak about a tree to hide the forests. Uh, Camilla, your uh, example on uh, the drawbacks of this castle culture and how we can be destroying the livelihood of a humble peasant family somewhere in Africa that needs this business to, to feed their own children uh, without really knowing what's going on. It, it was really touching. Uh, regarding the uh, Nafis, you have been absolutely wonderful. and. And uh, regarding these uh, um, um, uh, prospects of uh, end of civilization, I, I would like to say here, I mean, people are not conscious, but this happened before. I mean, salinization actually uh, uh, destroyed more than one civilization. The Mesopotamian one is the most uh, obvious case. And salinization is going on in a lot of the world, actually not that much in this tropical and uh, these uh, very humid climates, but anywhere else it is going on. And, and my issue here is uh, 
uh, I think we are facing um, the need, as you, you said, to have an holistic, a balanced, and uh, an approach that does not have conflicts of interest. But uh, if we are just aiming at the, the publicity, uh, you know, something that goes viral, I know how it goes. I mean, you have a case of where, where a crime is being committed on palm oil, you make it viral and everybody says, oh, all, all palm oil is like that. I mean, shall we really go to the, the opposite? I mean, to say something that is wonderful about palm oil and try to say, oh, everything is like that, or palm oil, certified palm oil. Uh, shouldn't the responsible institutions be very careful to have a narrative that does not contain conflicts of interests, that is balanced, and that is holistic. That's really my um, concern, and uh, whoever uh, would like to come to it, um, you will be very welcome. It is to the full audience of our commentators, the issue I'm raising. Thank you, uh, Paulo. Um, that was a really interesting and uh, kind of big picture a reminder of, of, of what's at stake. Um, and I think, yes, it's, uh, I have, I have a fine, before we go to Q&A, um, I guess that's a great point for me to direct um, the question to the panel, if you'd like to have any more further thoughts or, you know, what is it, what are the everyday steps that consumers can take to help reduce deforestation and other threats to the environment and biodiversity? You know, what are the everyday things that the, the ordinary consumers can do? And anyone who wants to uh, speak, please just um, feel free to, 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 to say a few words. I think one of the things could be really asking where your products are coming from and being interested in that, right? Um, whether it's fashion or beauty, once you start getting interested in where your stuff is coming from, that's just the beginning. Uh, and then you can start to make choices based upon the information that appeals to you you know we we also don't want to be self-righteous and say this is the way to go vegan we are so diverse we have different cultures religions there's no one answer but once you start being interested in that then you will find within your your lifestyle and your culture then you can start to apply you know uh your your consumption based around that that's that's what i think the easiest place to start. <laughs> no, that's really good um, food for thought and makes a lot of sense. Is there um, anyone else have any other thoughts on this? Um, following that, you know, making sure that you are aware of um, and get educated on about the subject, knowing where, uh, asking the questions, knowing where the products or the things you buy come from. I think next to that, one of our biggest responsibilities is holding these companies and the players in these industries responsible for producing the things um, or in the way in the way that we uh, we want it and that is good for the environment, but also for uh, humanity, keeping human rights and everything in mind. I think holding them responsible um, is one thing that we can also um, contribute in. Amina, would you like to um, give us your kind of concluding thoughts on this issue of what we can, of what consumers can do? I think, yeah, becoming educated on the topic is really important. Um, in terms of learning more, it's interesting that there are some market leaders in brands who are giving consumers more information, like it can be a simple page on their website, you know? Um, where people can go and read up about um, how responsible these brands are being. Um, but I also think that if there is a standard that is all encompassing and does take the issue into account in a holistic way, then I think that really needs to be the, the focus of the conversation in ensuring that this is what brands are buying into. And then secondary from that, I mean, my background is social media, immediately to mind comes a PR strategy, you know. Um, I think we need experts from all these different fields to create, like um, Camilla said, a sense of 
a story being told so that people can understand and it makes it more digestible for people when you give them a story, um, whether it is through ad form, whether it is through more conventions and forums, there are still, there's so, there's ample ways to spread the knowledge. Um, it's just, how do you get the consumers to buy on? And I think that starts with content, online content. Yeah, so a lot about communication, um, really getting communication out there. I, I guess, Robert, I mean, um, obviously you, you can't speak directly for consumers in that way, but one of, I mean, the, one of the, the challenges I can see here is that, you know, there are certain certification standards like RSPO, which um, are a little bit better known. Although I know I'm aware that there were surveys done which showed that, you know, even RSPO is something, it's like a minuscule percentage of consumers are even aware that it exists. So the big challenge we have really is, you know, how do we get consumers um, more aware, not just aware of um, say kind of um, the seemingly more obscure standards like MSPO, but even to get to that point where even if they, because I, the, I guess the impulse we have is, even if they're aware, how do they make sure that that's what they're buying? You know, how do they make sure that the brands that they support are going to switch to a certification scheme, which is actually much more uh, effective? Um, that's kind of a big challenge. Um, what's your thoughts on that? Uh... Well, I think the uh, three other panelists have pretty well offered up the uh, solutions. Uh, there's got to be storytelling. There's got to be content. And this whole package must be made easy to understand, where somebody could take a look at, uh, say, for example, a, a logo on a packaging and go, oh, yeah, OK, I saw something related to this. It was a video on YouTube about uh, this partic uh, particular group or uh, certification scheme doing good things. They're saving elephants or orangutans and things like that. <clears throat> and on the other hand, you have uh, stories coming out to support that logo as well. So I think that's, uh, that's the biggest challenge for the palm oil industry itself if they would take the advice of the three other panelists that have spoken up this morning and put it out there. You need storytelling, you need content, and you need to make the whole package really, really simple to understand because I don't see a lot of people going around asking, well, where is my uh, canola coming from? Or where's my palm oil coming from? They just want to relate it to, uh, to that one logo that stands for something, as the other panelists say just to take a look at that one logo and say, yeah, I, I've seen something on this, uh, on social media, it did go viral <clears throat> and I understand what they're doing. So I'm going to buy the product that contains this logo. So that perhaps is the uh, message or the takeaway for the palm oil industry itself. Listen to these uh, three consumer experts. Mariam, uh, I saw that maybe, did you want to say something it's, um, or did I misunderstand? Uh, me? Yes. No, no, I was just agreeing. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. I thought on it as well. Um, yeah, it was just more uh, agreeing with whatever was being said. Oh, no, that's fine. Okay. Well, I mean, I think... Um... You're on mute. Ah, sorry. We have like dozens of questions, um, audiences chomping at the bit to get answers so let me um let me okay let me just bring up some of these questions uh, i've got so many i'm uh, trying to get to the top rather than starting at the bottom okay so our first question is from from uh, belvinda strong and then she's asked uh, what about um i mean this might be a question for you Robert, to begin with, what about the no palm oil labels prevalent in Europe? Are they not doing enormous harm to farmers who depend on this sector for their living? Um, what do you think about that? Um, that's a complex question, but 
basically I see the no palm oil labels in Europe uh, practicing a fair bit of greenwashing when they roll out the no palm oil uh, marketing gimmicks. Uh, <laughs> it's needless to say that they are harming the farmers in Malaysia and Indonesia and uh, all the other countries that, uh, that produce palm oil. But we have to also remember that uh, the, the agriculture industries in Europe is a very powerful lobby. And their first interest, I, I, I would say, is the livelihoods of the uh, farmers itself. So <clears throat> in that sense, I wouldn't really uh, bring the livelihoods of uh, farmers into into the discussions on uh, power of free labels. What I would bring up is what are they substituting it with? Uh, are they going with uh, soy? Are they going with sunflower? Is any of this certified? I'll bet you it's not. So they're trying to cover up uh, whatever weaknesses they have in their substitute by simply saying that they're palm oil free, hoping that uh, everybody understands that being palm oil free is, is better, but it's not. You know, if you take a look at the, uh, <clears throat> the data out there, for example, uh, palm oil only uses about 8.6% of all the uh, agricultural lands used to, used to uh, cultivate vegetable oils. You know, what are you really saving when you're targeting, uh, targeting a, com a commodity that only uses uh, so little land compared to something like soy that uses something like 200 million hectares or even sunflower. Sunflower, I think is about 33 million hectares. Whereas if you look at palm, uh, at the most globally, we might be looking at about 20, 20 to 23 million hectares. So what are they trying to what what are they trying to sell when they uh, say that they're palm oil free? Personally, I think they're trying to hide the fact that the rest of the raw materials that they use in their products are not very good for the environment, and they're hoping that nobody will ask that question simply because, well, we blessed it all by saying it's palm oil free. I mean, it seems to me that um, you know, the big challenge we have here really is that it's a policy making problem that begins in a sense with um, the fact that in, 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 in countries like the West, countries like you, uh, Britain or the United States or elsewhere, we, we just don't have enough um, kind of drive behind making sure that what consumers are being told is actually informing them of what's going on. So it seems to me that that's something that consumers, there needs to be something which dry, on the one hand, the pressure can come from consumers if they're more aware that these labels are misleading, but there's also a sense of responsibility on why is it that um, the European Union, for instance, hasn't really moved forward with being open about really what's at stake with these kinds of labels and things like that. And there's a big gap there, um, and it really does require uh, a meeting of minds, you know, across the divide, uh, and a recognition that you know we, we can't just keep making the conversation about one commodity. You know, we, and I think that shift is beginning to take place, um, but we have a long way to go. I mean, um, we have a question here from uh, Saeed Khan, who is a senior lecturer at Wayne State University in in Michigan. And he says that surveys show the vast majority of respondents are willing to change their daily consumption of palm oil products to ones that are sustainably sourced. That's interesting. Um, but then he asks, I think we may have answered this question. What are the three easy steps that can encourage any committed consumer to reach that goal? Uh, the consumer experts going to speak on this issue? Can you repeat that question again, so, please? So, so we have surveys which show that actually the vast majority of, of seemingly consumers are willing to change their consumption of palm oil products to sustainable ones. 
um, which is obviously a good thing. So now he's saying, so in, if, so we know that there is a, when you ask people, they want, to, they're willing to change. So he's saying, what are the three easy, the three easy steps that can encourage any of these consumers to reach that goal? So I'll, I'll, I'll start and maybe somebody can jump in. Um, I don't know about three easy steps. Uh, I, I started a, a beauty brand actually, a sustainable beauty brand over 13 years ago. It was very, very early using pure, beautiful ingredients. What I've found with the consumer, and these were very pure raw ingredients from Africa. And when I brought them onto the marketplace, I was really targeting a, you know, consumer of African descent. I was highly surprised about how it was you know, received. People didn't care. The consumer wants results. We talked a lot about beauty. You know, women, you know, we spend a lot of money on our beauty products. It's probably, I don't know what the percentages are, but it's pretty high. Um, in the United States, you know, I learned this from having my own brand. Beauty is not regulated, right? Nobody's gonna come and double check if, you know, this is really vegan or whatever. You know, obviously now with council culture, people are doing the right thing. Some, you know, most of the time you'd say. Uh, the three things I feel like that could encourage people is one, we need to engage with the big, the big brands like Amina said, right? Like these brands have to uh, jump on board. You know, we know that for beauty, at least for us in the States, there's the three major or the two major companies. It's Estee Lauder and L'Oreal. They own everything. They own everything and everything in between. If they get on board, this is, you know, and they, they, they buy into this policy, it's much bigger impact because they have, so many, such huge portfolio, that's one thing. The other thing is like we said, having these stories palatable, like how do they, how do they include the consumer, right? So we're not so academic or, you know, we gotta meet them where they are, right? Uh, a lot of the times when we tell stories in awareness and SDGs and sustainability, it almost feels like scare tactics, you know, like, your life is going to end if this is going to happen. Oh, this is your life is over. How can you make them feel like their life will be vastly improved? The next generation, people love kids. If you can make anything, tell them this is for the kids, they're in, you know. Um, so that's also important too, like uh, educating that next generation, right? A lot of the work that I do, we look at actually educating as we concurrently educate the consumer and the producer. We are also educating children to join, you know, because people practice at home and children have such influence in their homes, what they learn at school. We're seeing it here in the States with underserved communities. When they go to their school and they learn about fresh food, they come home and they actually change the home and they actually start teaching the parents, right? So the two things. I think I'll leave the third thing to somebody else. <laughs> And then, you know, um, that, but that's what I can think of right now. Well, thanks, Karina. That was really interesting, um, especially to hear your own story. Uh, Amina, Mariam, do you have any thoughts to fill that final? Yeah, um, I used <laughs> to be a teacher. And um, what Camilla just said about kids learning things at school and coming and teaching, and I also know being a mom as well, is absolutely bang on. And actually, something new I've learned, and I just realized that is such a genius idea, actually, to spread the knowledge. Because if we get this information into curriculum, school curriculums, even on a basic level, you know, in geography or something, um, at secondary school, for example, um, I think that would have a massive impact. Um, and also, in terms of communicating the message, we talked about storytelling. I think the human story, because it can be so evocative um, and because so, so many people are moved because of empathy, is something that can really be used to not just educate people, but do it in a way that is sensitive. Um, and so any content that is created, any kind of communication that happens, I think in terms of as a consumer, because you know we, we're not bothered if that brand is making a profit, the, the brand is bothered, we're not. Um, and so for us to really buy into it, we wanna know about that human story. And um, we talked about L'Oreal and Estee Lauder, some of their, you know, greatest campaigns that, that really shifted public perception of things like diversity. L'Oreal were the first to do it a couple of years ago. 
um, to really address it in a mainstream way. You saw the ads everywhere. It was huge. Um, and they really changed the tone of how diversity was perceived and how attractive it was for other brands. And it, they made it marketable, you know. They, and so that is really the, the power of advertising and, and, and of brands and um, what they can do in shifting the narrative. Thanks, Amina. That's really interesting. Maren, did you have yeah, anything I, to add to that? Or? I think yeah, if, I, if I could just say, uh, <laughs> you know, a good example of that, maybe uh, <clears throat> a third example would be something that the uh, Malaysian Palm Oil Council tweeted recently. Uh, the tweet basically say, save the elephant uh, through your purchases of food and cosmetics. And by that, they were, they were suggesting that food and cos cosmetics that uh, uses certified palm oil like the RSPO or the MSPO actually works to save wildlife. So maybe more of that messaging needs to come out from the uh, Malaysian Palm Oil Council or uh, uh, the other uh, producing countries is trying to relate palm oil to positive things that are happening in the home countries. Mariam, did you want to say something? Um, I think everything has been already said about what consumers can do uh, on a daily basis. Um, maybe the last thing, but I think we've already discussed it as well. Just make sure that you have all the information and then it's up to us to spread that information in any way we can, making sure that it reaches more and more people. Thank you very much. That's um good roundup I mean, I think just to add um that there's it's important and we've mentioned that the palm oil industry can obviously do more to communicate um what's going on and raise awareness but I think there also needs to be a move from policymakers um in the west and, and journalists to take that interest in what's actually going on um in, in these countries in these producing countries whether they're in Africa or whether they're in in in, in Southeast Asia um, that really, it's, this needs to be a, a reciprocal move, I would say. That's the really important implication, I think, of some of the conversations we're having. Um, so we have some more questions to go through. A question here from Aina Bashir, Basharova, who is a researcher and PhD candidate in Brussels. Uh, the UN SDGs seem to be of the scope and scale that only governments, companies and palm oil producers can make an impact. So given their increased awareness and purchase power influence, what role can consumers play in helping to attain the SDGs? So a slightly broader question, really, going beyond issues around palm oil, what can consumers do to, to, to move, to, to, to get brands and businesses and governments uh, to really take on the SDGs seriously? Which I think is a really good question because the SDGs, in a way, have kind of fallen. I don't know if you guys feel like this, but I feel like people don't talk so much about the SDGs. I mean, sometimes they do in circles like this, kind of it's kind of niche. But there was a time when everyone was going on about the SDGs, and now it's just kind of like not really spoken about. So it'd be good to get your thoughts on what what can consumers do to kind of bring this back into into kind of the public discourse and make it really something that companies listen to. Shall we start with you, Camilla? Sure. <laughs> I'm like dying for this one. <laughs> no. Um, so for me personally, I actually shifted my um, my business when the SDGs were being proposed. I feel like I was doing so many things, and for me, the SDGs provided me like a, a mandate, uh, some guidelines to follow, and also an easy way to explain like my vision in terms of like my development work on a scalable level, even if I was in the private sector, um, there was a big, um, a big uh, excitement about this uh, mandate and everybody was excited, 193 countries signed in, and then it just kind of didn't translate towards the consumer. Well, we know that a lot of brands have signed on to this mandate, but there's a disconnect. Like actually I believe the United Nations should do a much better job. They provided us this mandate and really marketing it is what's the challenge. It's the same issue we're discussing right now. 
How do you make this palatable? How do you make this easy for the consumer? I, you know, I still, I live in the States and right now, and I, people don't know what the SDGs are. You know, I'm constantly like educating people on what they are and the fact that they're there. I think something that could be attractive for, for consumers would be, especially from the uh, small business entrepreneurial side is them understanding they are part of this. There's a complete disconnect. I work a lot with uh, the African diaspora and connecting them to the continent and African-Americans are not included in any kind of UN initiatives, which is really crazy because the UN is headquartered in New York City, right? And, and so there's really like, how do we include, inclusion is really important in these conversations because the SDGs really targets the people that are underserved, right? Like I see so many opportunities for SDGs in the uh, underserved communities in the States that are not being uh, utilized and leveraged. And I'm constantly telling people in, in, in my business as I advise these companies and startups, I'm like, do you realize that what you're doing is actually checking off like six SDGs? They're like, what is SDGs? And I'm like, it could completely transform your business. Like if you aligned and showed the world because you have this policy that's global, right? And how can we utilize this policy to, to grow enterprise? That's, that's what I see is the opportunity is how can we, once people are making money and profit, they will buy into the mandate, right? But if they don't see the value, like, okay, it's great. This is, as it sounds great. It sounds like very smart people talking about the climate change, but uh, it, well, how is that gonna impact, affect my life? Like I get up nine to five is like enough, eight hours. I got the family. How can they benefit and gain value from such a huge, uh, a beautiful policy, but how does it, you know, basically like, as people say in the streets, how am I making money? You know, <laughs> exactly. That's no, a good question. I mean, yeah, Mariam, please. Yeah, um, I was just going to say, I don't know if you've heard about um, what recently the UN also, uh, they broke as a plan, it was um, uh, their sustainability pledge. What they did actually was offer a free and open source solution to tackle challenges and to offer companies to be able to um, well be transparent and trace everything in, in the production process. So uh, not only the policy, but this was more related to clothing and footwear. Um, they um, offered a solution and there are some companies who are already working with it or it's being implemented right now. And I think in September, they were going to introduce this in Milan. Um, it's about using blockchain and DNA tracing and um, also certified producers, manufacturers, etc., to make sure that brands can uh, gather, gather all of this information about the whole production process by using this open source solution. So for that it's not an issue for brands to, um, or smaller brands um, to be implementing these things, they can use what they have already worked on. Um, I know this is happening um, for the clothing and the footwear um, industry. Um, I don't think they have already that in place for the beauty industry or any other industry. But we, we, it would be interesting if you know they could actually offer these solutions, these um, free solutions, free open software that people can use um, to make sure that their consumers know where everything is coming from, instead of letting just having indeed, as we said, having the policy out there and just letting people figure it out or whatever, but offering the solution as well. Um, and I know indeed, I don't know if you've heard about it, but it's really interesting to read about it. Um, the thing that is being done right now or offered for the clothing industry. I think if we can, uh, you know, have this over the line of different industries that it will be interesting and more people will apply it because if you give already the solution, they will adapt it. But if you let people just think for themselves and just give the policy and be like, figure it out. It's usually, as I said before, we have to make it as easy as possible to process everything, but also to, for the companies and et cetera, to adapt and implement these things. We have to make it easy for them as well if we want change to happen. Um, so, you know, about the SDGs and about UN, this is being done 
and hopefully they will offer the solutions as well for the other um, industries as well. Armin, I wondered if you had any thoughts on that question. Um, I think everything's been said. <laughs> I agree with everything the ladies have said um, and Robert as well. I think that yeah, making the, making the information digestible is the most important. Look, working in this industry, I know people's attention spans are getting smaller and smaller. You know, we had YouTube videos, which, which would typically be 15 minutes. And then there was like Instagram feed posts, which were like one minute. And then you've got TikTok, which started off as now a bit longer. It was like 15 seconds. So you have to quickly grab people's attention. So we need experts collaborating, you know, from across but in a holistic way to, to make it. And I think to make it not only digestible for people, but something that people care about. And I think what Camilla said is really interesting in that people didn't care when she started her brand off. I think that the, the, the consumers are changing now. Um, and having been doing this job for over 10 years, I've seen how that shift has happened in that people, even if it's like a niche, small group of people putting pressure on brands, they will get something done. Like, um, you know, animal cruelty was was a couple of years ago huge. Like the, the conversation is a big conversation, but it was really at the forefront a couple of years ago. And I remember with L'Oreal, we got taken on a trip to France and they took us as influencers into the lab to show us how how they didn't test on animals, but what they did do as an alternative. And here we were capturing that information and putting it out there. And so they were really forward thinking in offering that up before they were, and they were under pressure anyway, but really before it became the only thing people talked about. So I think in terms of brands and profit and their um, longevity in this space, I think it makes sense for them as well. It's sort of a win-win for everyone. Oh, thank you. Um... Really, really interesting. Um, I have a more policy focused question here, Robert, for you um, from uh, unidentified attendee who's asking, what is the current status of MSPO certification today? Uh, percentage of, the, for example, the percentage of Malaysian palm oil which has been certified and what are the main challenges for the mandatory rollout of MSPO? Uh, the current status of MSPO certification is uh, close to 90%. The last time I uh, uh, read up on it, which is quite amazing considering that they were able to cover it uh, within a short period of time. Uh, <clears throat> main challenges for the mandatory rollout of MSPO. I I think most of the uh, challenges came from the uh, came from the smaller producers, the mid-sized plantation guys, uh, the smallholders, who did not understand why Malaysian palm oil had to be a hundred percent certified. Um, <clears throat> discussions I had with some of them was that uh, you know they are at the mercy of the market, anyways. Uh, whether it's competing with other palm oil producing countries and especially uh, competing with uh, soy producing countries. So their point was, well, 2% of soy is uh, certified. Why do we want 100% of our palm oil uh, to be certified? So that was, that was the big challenge and uh, kudos to the government. I think they were able to convince the um, uh, <clears throat> the mid-sized producers that it was important for Malaysia to build up a uh, distinguished brand of palm oil. And that uh, if the industry were to keep fighting for the uh, scraps at the bottom of the barrel, that it'd be impossible for the industry to survive because you've got things like uh, <clears throat> minimum wages in late in uh, labor is much higher in Malaysia compared to other producing countries. And you've got all these different standards, you've got all these different taxes and duties, all these different layers of government that regulate the industry almost to death. But those regulations are needed. So <clears throat> uh, having overcome that main challenge, which is the uh, mid-sized players, there wasn't a problem with the with the uh, big industry 
companies from what I saw, most of them understood the need for, uh, for certification. Some grumbled that, you know, they had to undergo double certification under the RSPO and now the MSPO. But <clears throat> they supported the MSPO anyways. Uh, now with the uh, mid-sized guys taken care of, I think the remaining 10% that needs to be certified is mostly independent smallholders. And those guys will be fairly difficult to certify. Um, you know, the whole question of uh, not getting a premium aside, you'll have a lot of them that are older, that do not read or write. So when you're asking them to uh, keep documents, uh, keep information on their uh, daily farm activities, it becomes hard for these people. So that, mm. that little segment there, that 10%, that is going to take some uh, extra tender loving care from the Malaysian industry to, to reach out to these people and say, look, certification is not just about premiums, uh, a big part of the MSPO certification for smallholders is actually about protecting their health and welfare. You know, things like, uh, base, basic things like, how do you handle the chemicals? Where do you store them? You know, an audit will show <clears throat> how all of that is being done. And if it's not correct, then the uh, auditor will come in and say, you know, we suggest that perhaps you build a shed to store the chemicals, keep, uh, keep the farm equipment away uh, outside of the house. And <clears throat> if they can't afford it, I think the MSCPO still has a, uh, uh, a subsidy for the smallholders. If they can't afford to build a shed, the uh, MSPO will step in and uh, provide funding for that shed to be built because they want the health and uh, welfare of the small farmers to be taken care of. So. All in all, it's a good thing. There were some, uh, some challenges. Uh, the toughest one being the, the mid-sized players. Uh, I think once they've overcome that, hopefully once the pandemic is over, the MSPO will be able to reach out to the remaining uh, smallholders, independent smallholders, and get that, uh, reach that 100% uh, mark. Okay, thank you so much, Robert, for that extensive reply. Um, well, we've come to the end. I have kept all of you on far longer than we should have, but it's been an absolute pleasure. I'd like to thank all of you, Robert, Mariam, Amina, Camilla, um, in no particular order, of course, <laughs> as well as Klaus and, and, and Paulo for sharing with us your really wonderful insights. Um, I think we've learned a lot. I've learned a lot. Um, I think the basic takeaway I can see is that we really need to have more dialogue about these issues, we need to raise awareness. There's a lot that each of us can do. We mustn't underestimate the power of our own voice, um, but we should, all of us who are listening, try to take something away from this, learn something about what we're buying, consuming, um, and see if we can make a greater contribution. Um, but I, I don't wanna uh, keep you guys uh, for, for any more longer than we, we've got, we've overrun uh, so far, but thank you so much. It's been really, really informative. Um, and I think this is going to make a difference. I think this is hopefully the start of further dialogues, which maybe CSPO and, and maybe other institutions can can uh, can take forward um, and kind of allow this conversation to kind of begin to inform what's really going on out there. So thank you so much for your time. It's been a real pleasure to hear from you.